Welcome to First Star Logistics in the Trenches with Dave Lapham and special guest uh, for this podcast episode, the legendary Tom Browning. Your birthday is the same as my older brother, April 28th. How about that? Man, the old left. And Barry Larkin. Oh, and Bar- it's right, and Barry Larkin, too. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's Saddam Hussein. <laughs> we'll, we'll forget that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's uh, a few of them, though. Jay Leno, Ann Margaret, Jessica Alba. Wow. I mean, uh, we actually had we had another player, Louis Quinona. Huh. Uh, Barry's four years younger than I am, and, and Louis was two years younger than I am. Unbelievable. You win 123 games with the Cincinnati Reds, 31 complete games. Heck of a career for Tom Browning. Uh, what what was what was the big deal? I know I know at one point um, in your minor league career you learned the screwball. You know you you perfected the screwball. Is that what made turn the corner for you professionally? Is, is that screwball pitch that that strikeout pitch for you? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, it it, it complemented my fastball, but uh, I remember his name was Harry Doris. Was my pitching? Uh, he was the pitching coordinator back then. They didn't have pitching coaches at every stop like they do now but he was i went to instructional league after my rookie year in uh, billings montana and uh he taught it to me and he told me he said you have to learn to, to to command it and for three weeks uh i got my brains beat in because i just didn't couldn't command it and i you know instructional league back then it was used as a top 25 prospect in the organization and they put a team together and you played about six weeks. And uh, so for the first three weeks of, of instruction league, uh, Harry said, you know, just said, keep, keep throwing it, keep throwing it. And, uh, and like I said, for three weeks, I got my brains beat in because I just didn't have the command of it. But then once I got command of it, uh, it kind of just complimented my fastball. And uh, the next year I went through high A and double A in, one, in, in that one year. And then the next year, triple A. Uh, in my second full season, then got called up to the big leagues at the end of that year. At the uh, during the fall instructional league around that time, from you went eight and one, 101 strikeouts in 78 and two thirds innings. 101 strikeouts in 78 and two thirds. I mean, once you get that thing perfected, man, you were deadly. Well, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know if it was because uh, I wasn't a strikeout pitcher when, I, especially when I got the major leagues. I was, I didn't consider myself. Uh, I think I don't think I ever had more than nine strikeouts in a game in the major leagues. Now in the minor leagues, I had a few games where I struck out, you know, ten plus. But I, I just to be honest, David, I never ever thought myself to be a strikeout pitcher. But uh, I did throw a lot of fastballs, and when when the screwball came along, it the the hitters had to respect that, uh, which allowed me to throw more fastballs because I I love throwing my fastball. So uh, when, when you were at uh, AAA Wichita uh, on July yeah. 31st that year, you threw a seven inning no hitter against Iowa. And then you get a call right. up, a call up to the Reds in your major league debut. You beat Oral Hershiser and the Dodgers. You go eight and a third innings, give up just one run. I mean, does that feel like it was just yesterday? You have great memories of that. <laughs> it went by so fast. You know, it's just, and you, you know as well, you know, when you're playing, you don't, you think you're going to do it forever. Right. You know, you're just in the middle of it and you just, you know, life couldn't be any better. You know, you got kids, you got the wife. I mean, everything was just, and it just went by really fast. Uh, but yeah, it feels like it was yesterday. I remember when I got called up. Well, um, actually, let me go back to that no hitter in AAA. Uh, it was a guy named Chuck Montgomery who was my, he was the scout that signed me. Well, he showed up huh. uh, for whatever reason on the, you know, uh, in Iowa. And he said, hey, we'll have breakfast the next day, you know. And I said, okay. And I ended up throwing a no-hitter. Uh, and so we go to lunch the next day. And, and he said, well, if, if we'd have known you were going to get, gonna get to the organization so fast, uh, we'd have offered you more money. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, they gave me, thir- I had a $3,500 sign and bonus. And, and I, I said, heck, I only asked for five grand. And they just told me 3500 take her to leave it. So anyway, <laughs> come to find out, a few years passed, and I ran into a guy named Jim Fergozzi, who was the sure. AAA manager uh, for the Cardinals. And he says, and I saw him at a winter meeting. He said, Tom, you don't know how close you came to becoming a, a, a St. Louis Cardinal. 
he said we had a trade all set up and uh, we had all the part all the pieces put together and they were going to they were going to trade you to the Cardinals that you were pitching that night. And Bob Housen said he's pitching tonight. We'll wait till after he pitches. I ended up throwing a no hitter, and they canceled the deal. So, uh, <laughs> which was great because I grew up a Reds fan, and I didn't want to play for anybody but the Reds. Right. So, anyway, I get called up in uh, in September, and I show up in L.A. on a Friday. And I walk in the clubhouse, and I meet Pete Rose, because he had just taken over for the Reds. And uh, he says, hey, by the way, Mario Soto's wife went into labor. He had to go home. You're pitching on Sunday. <laughs> You're starting on Sunday. So, you know, as a September call-up, sure. you know, we're always hoping that we get a chance to maybe get in a game here or there or, you know, at least pitch a little bit. Uh, you, you know, starting the game never came into uh, into our into my thought. Uh, but sure enough, it did, you know. And the cool thing is I had Jim Cotter, the pitching coach, uh, uh, when I got there. So, and he was, we were like, we hit it off pretty well because he was a left-hander that worked quick, whatever. So, sure, sure. Uh, but yeah, I took a, a shutout into the ninth inning, you know? So, and I think what that did is that allowed me uh, to get a couple more starts. They gave me a couple more starts in September uh, about, you know, to finish off the season. So, so then you're, you're in the next year, your rookie year, you go 20 and nine. A 3.55 ERA, the first rookie to win 20 games since the Yankees. Uh, Bob Grimm did it in 1954. You go 20 and nine. You finish the season with 11 straight wins, longest streak by a Reds pitcher in 30 years. You're the Sporting News National League Rookie Pitcher of the Year. Man, what was that year like for you? That was magical. Um, you know, the cool thing, David, is, is like I said, Jim Cott was a pitching coach. And he was a big proponent of the four-man rotation. Mm -hmm. So, and he talked Pete into. We started that year, nineteen eighty-five, uh, on a, on a four-man rotation. I, and I, I was me and Mario. I think John Cooper was there, and I, I don't know Andy McGaffey. I don't remember who who the components were. I know I was one of them. Uh, Mario was really just kicking butt. Uh, first, like four starts, he was like four zero. But it was just really cool, you know. And, and let me tell you, the starts were coming rapid fire. I mean, you threw in a game, you took a day off, you threw on the side, took a day off, and then you're pitching again, you know. I mean, it was and it was fun. Uh, and and believe me, if I if I ever were able to uh, put together, you know, a pitching staff, I, that's what I would do. I would I would go to a four man. But anyway, uh, I, I had I think uh, 18 starts on on three days rest that year. I was 15 and three. Uh, I remember we went on strike for two days in uh, in uh, like August. Yeah. And, and I ended up getting a twenty thousand dollar raise. Um, and my grandson just showed up, so it may get a little noisy in here. Um, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, so it was. It was. Pete came and said, "You're starting. To re you're pitching the rest of the year on three days rest." And and I just was able to, you know, put together a pretty good streak. Uh, I remember one day, if I may. Dave Parker got into an argument with Mike Sosha of the Dodgers. And uh, <laughs> and I said, don't worry, Dave, I'll take care of him tomorrow. So the next day, uh, I'm pitching against Fernando Valenzuela, and uh, I hit Mike Sosha. I don't know if it, what inning it was, uh, but they ended up scoring six runs off me. Oh, man. And uh, I came in after the inning, and we scored eight, and I got a win. <laughs> 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 so it was, it was pretty cool, you know. I mean, just you know, again, I, I said it was magical because you just, you know, I, I never won 20 games again. You know, I, I got to 18, but I mean, uh, to do it your first year and, uh, you know, in such fashion. And then, of course, Vince Coleman stole 100 bases that year and he ended up getting rookie of the year. So, right, right. Um, but, you know, I, I still got rookie picture. I still got an award. And, you know, you actually, I got a really good raise, too, which was, you know, because of, of the event. But, I remember I did a uh, – sorry, I'm trying to like, keep him quiet. I, 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 that winter, Kenny Anderson and I had become good friends with a guy named Bob Knoll mm -hmm. uh, from Suburban Chevrolet. And he asked us to do some commercials, so I, I think radio commercials for UK basketball. Or I don't know who the, the uh, actual TV commercials were for. But uh, anyway, I got the Johnny Vandermeer Award that year for Picture of the Year. So we're having a banquet. And Mark Shaw found out that I did the commercials for those uh, uh, for Suburban Chevrolet, yeah. and she wanted to she wanted to trade me. 
her so competitor, people, man. That's her competitor. <laughs> well, then she put in a, a clause in the contract or that it was a, it was kind of like a gentleman's agreement that she would give us a, a, a car uh, at a hundred dollars over car. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, that that season you, in '88. You go eighteen and five. And you had a, had a heck of a year there. The, I, I think the biggest thing about you was consistency. I mean, double-digit wins for seven straight seasons. You were always healthy, available, very consistent. I mean, you took, obviously, great pride in availability, accountability, all those things, didn't you? Oh, I love taking that ball every fifth day because, you know, I was an everyday player in a pitcher's body. You know, I, <laughs> right. wanted to be, I, want, I wanted to be an everyday player. I wanted to be the starting center fielder for the Cincinnati Reds, you know, and uh, but obviously I had to, I had to be a pitcher and, and that, uh, you know, and, and, and I certainly was prideful of that, but yes, I took pride in, in, in towing that rubber every fifth day and sometimes every fourth day. Uh, but I took pride in that. I mean, I like, I think I led the league in starts a few times and, you know, I wanted to lead the league in any pitch. You know, that was one of my big, one of my biggest goals was to lead the league in any pitch one year. I never got there. I was always, you know, in the top 10 or something, but. You know, that was kind of one of my, my, my goals was to lead the league in any pitch. So superstitions. I mean, you, you had a couple of superstitions. You didn't want to shave between <laughs> starts. And what, where'd the red underwear on, on game days come from? With yeah, team? see, that, that, that's such a uh, – well, you know, those are the – you know, I don't know what they call them now, but they were just the compression shorts, you know? I got you. Uh, every, year, every year a company comes by and they got these, you know, underwear, compression shorts, whatever. Right, right. Uh, and they had a red pair, and I said, "Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll take those." And I said, I'll, "I'll call it Red Jordan. I wear them on game day, and I'll call it Red Jordan." <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, that, that was just was the uh, you know like the, the drinking of the iced tea. I didn't shave in between starts. I'll tell you what happened. My rookie year, uh, I shaved on because it was really you know I had it had a heavy growth, so I said I, I better shave. And it was game day, and I and I so I shaved that morning. And I went out there and gave up a three-run homer to Pedro Guerrero, and I ended up losing three to nothing. Uh, so I said, I'm not shaving in between starts ever again. You know, so uh, that probably I modified that. I think as I got older and I got grayer and it started growing in faster. But yeah, I just uh, that was one of my things. I'm gonna I can shave till after I pitch uh, every every time. So all right, so you uh, but that, we had a few, yeah, yeah. Well. You're known as Mr. Perfect, and rightfully so. September 16th of 88, the 12th perfect game in baseball history is pitched by Tom Browning. one nothing over the Dodgers. Man, you and the Dodgers, man, you had you had something going on with those guys. You're at Riverfront. Well, you, you, I, there you, was nobody. It was, it was, I love beating the Dodgers. I grew up a Reds fan. I grew up a Dodger hater, uh, giant hater. I didn't really care. You know, Padres and – Houston there, but really were in it too much. But I certainly didn't like. wasn't a big fan of the Dodgers, uh, and I love beating Tom Lasorda. And uh, <laughs> I mean, just just you know, just because he was such an icon there. I mean, you'd show up, uh, you get off the bus to get for game day, and you know, about two thirty, and he's out there with no shirt on, so I'm batting practice, you know. And he didn't he didn't have a major league body, uh, <laughs> but he'd be out there, you know, in the California sun and. and you know, a pair of pants on, you know, his curveballs and stuff like that. So uh, I do remember because I, I, I did a thing for uh, Ted Williams Museum down in Florida one year, and he was the guest speaker. And I happened to get invited down there, and I didn't get a chance to see him. But he told me, you know, he, he, and during his speech, he said he walked the streets of Cincinnati that night after I threw a perfect game. But he failed to mention that they were in first place and they would end up going on to win the World Series. But, uh, he, you know, he gave me some nice kudos, and, and then we crossed paths when I was, uh, you know, and doing instruction league and stuff, coaching myself. I ran into him there one day, and he came over to uh, uh, Goodyear to watch uh, the Dodgers minor league team play against the Reds, and I went over and talked to him after the game. I said, hey, Tim, Tommy, Tom Browning, oh, Tom Browning, how you doing? Hey, get a picture taken. I said, yeah, please, take a picture of me and Tommy. I said, because there's nobody I enjoy beating more than Tommy LaScord <laughs> and the Los Angeles Dodgers. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, you didn't. You only threw 102 pitches. 70 of them were strikes. You didn't have a three-ball count on a single batter. I mean, you stayed ahead of everybody. The first lefty to pitch a perfect game since Sandy Koufax pitched it one in 1965. The only Reds pitcher to to pitch one. I mean, that day though, what what, what did you know? 
right early in that baseball game that, man, you, you were in a groove, you had something cooking here, or did you have that feeling? You know, I had someone asked me, you know, what, did you do anything in the bullpen? And I, and I said, no, my bullpens are always the same. You know, I just tried to get loose and, and get command of that fastball to start the game and hopefully everything else shows up kind of thing. And, I mean, I approached it the same way. I mean, I was very superstitious. I, 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 I sat in the dugout. If it was a 7.35 game, uh, I, was, I was sat in the dugout from 7 o'clock to 7.15. And at 7.15, I walked down to the bullpen. And at 7.18, I threw my first pitch. And, you know, however long it took me to get ready. And then, you know, I always wanted to go uh, start the game ahead of time. Like as John Browdy used to be announcing, and he always announced the game, you know, start of the game, 7.35. So I tried to get it at 7.34. You know, just whatever I could do, just to, you know, but the umpires like me too, you know, because I, I work quick and I threw a lot of strikes. And, yep. uh, you know, I just kind of kept it, uh, my team in the game. I, you know, when Kevin Mitchell came over one year and I said, you know, just make sure you don't put your head down. I said, because I'm going to, I work quick and, and, I, and I need my outfielders because they got to run down a lot of stuff. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I just had a good rapport with them and, uh, uh, and, the, and the players, you know, that, you know, I was, I was a big proponent of being the best teammate you could be. So the, the, the days that I wasn't pitching, you know, I was probably one of the loudest guys in the, in the dugout, you know, on, on game yeah. day, I didn't do, I didn't say too much, uh, you know, cause I was just kind of focused on what I had to do. But on other days I was loud. And, hell, I got thrown out of a few games just because I was too loud probably. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that was, that was, you know, that's the one thing I, I tried to really, uh, put across to the kids when I was coaching, I said, you know, learn to be a good teammate. Learn to pull for your – even if the guy that's in front of you has your job and you want it, I said, you still got to be pulling for that guy because he's your teammate. So, yeah. I yeah. mean, that's just one of the things that, you know, I was taught. So three months you – know, yeah, three months before the, the perfect game, June 6th, you had a no-hitter broken up by Tony Gwynn who singled one out in the – in the uh, in the in the ninth inning. Ninth inning. Yeah, I mean, Tony. Well, Grant. I it, it was apropos that he got the hit because uh, I walked him three times that day. <laughs> not, not, not I didn't walk him intentionally. I just couldn't throw the ball over the plate for him for whatever reason. You know, every time I tried, he took, I just, oh yeah, my grandson's killing me. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so anyway, he ended up breaking up in the ninth inning. And I, you know, like I said, that was after Poe because then he actually probably swung at ball four and got a base hit. Unreal, so. Un- unbelievable. And then you throw the perfect game, and then you you almost threw two perfect games. Uh, <laughs> you had on the fourth of July in '89 against the Phillies at Veteran Stadium, a leadoff double yeah. by Dickie Thon uh, in the in the ninth inning uh, breaks up a, another perfect game. What pitch did he hit? Do you regret the pitch you threw? I do. Change it. Change it right down the middle. Really? Yeah. I, well, I just, you know, I tried to get, I tried to trick him and he, you know, I tricked myself probably. But the cool thing is, uh, you know, that was a, cause I, after the perfect game in 88, um, Marge shot, actually asked my wife to come to the stadium the next day, uh, for a presentation. So I, you know, I thought she was going to give me something nice and whatever. Uh, and she ended up giving me a stemmed rose. Freshly cut though, um, <laughs> but 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 then gave my wife a full length mink coat. Wow! So uh, which I I was totally okay with that, you know. So she wanted to put a clause in my contract that winter that if I do another perfect game, then my wife would get a three hundred thousand dollar bonus. <laughs> now Major League Baseball wouldn't let her put it in there, put 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 that clause in there. But that would have been nice to know. Well, two reasons. One, have been nice being the only guy to do it twice. Uh, but the second time to see if she if, if uh, she to take care of my wife, give my wife the money, which she would have. So I'm pretty sure. That's great. So in 1990, obviously the best team you ever played on with the Reds, they go to the postseason first and only time in your career. Uh, you, you won 15 games that year. You get a big win over the Pirates in Game Two of the Champion National League Championship Series, and then uh, the Oakland A's heavily favored. You guys historically sweep them. You win Game Three. What was that feeling like? Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. 
acting. You know, exactly what you think it was. As a kid, you know, when you're dreaming about pitching in the World Series or playing in the World Series, I mean, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. I'll tell you, <coughs> when the Oakland came to town, uh, I, I actually made a point to stay out there and watch them take batting practice. Hmm. You know, in Cincinnati, I've, I've seen, I, I think I've seen uh, two red seat home runs in my whole career there. You know, in the 10, 11 years I was there, I don't think I saw but two red seaters. And those guys were batting practice. Every single one of them would hit them in the red seat. I said, oh, my God, look at these. They're, they're just monsters, you know. <laughs> uh, and then Conseco hit a home run off Danny Jackson in game two, uh, opposite field in the green seat. I said, oh, my God, how far do you think he would hit one of my balls? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we knew that we had good pitching. And we had, well, first of all, we had the nasty boys. We had Jose Rio, who was probably the best pitcher in baseball at that time. Yeah. Uh, and he was just dominant. And he was just, you know, he, he kind of carried us in there. So, uh, but starting game three, well, actually, uh, game two was probably more significant because my son Tucker was born. I left the stadium. Uh, yeah, right. Tucker could be born. So she went into labor. And, you know, I had no idea I was supposed to, you know, they wanted me to pitch because I was pitching game three. So I thought I was safe to go. Right. Uh, and, and they, and Rick, no, Rick Stowe knew who I was, but I didn't, uh, I told them, they called the hospital looking for me. And I told the hospital, I said, oh, they're just calling to see if I had a boy or a girl. I said, don't even tell them I'm here. <laughs> um, so come to find, you know, I didn't listen to the radio or anything on the way to the hospital. So uh, we had to have a, a, a C-section. Uh, so they had to prep her for the C-section. So the doctor told me to go sit in the, uh, in the doctor's lounge and watch the game. So I, I went in there and I and I sat on the uh, uh, I sat on the couch there and I looked at the TV and, and it was just Tim McCarver and he was like staring at me saying, "Tom, if you're watching, I need you to come back to the ballpark. I need you to pitch." Well, I'm like, "What?" You know, I, I didn't know what to do, so I started getting up, wandering around, you know, walk, pacing back and forth, and uh, Billy Bates uh, gets a base hit, Cabo gets a base hit. Uh, and then Joe hit the ball down the line, and uh, Billy Bates took his home plate. The doctor throws open the door. He said, we're ready to go. I said, cool, we just won. So That was the 10th inning, uh, right? What's that? That was in the 10th inning, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I had no idea. You know, it, it didn't occur to me that they were going to – they might need me to pitch because I was pitching the next day. So, we ended up uh, – anyway, we won the game. The next day we get on the plane, you know, Lou Pinella said, hey, man, let somebody know. Because I told Rick Stowe because Rick Stowe came up and – asked me, you know, or actually told me that my wife was in labor. She was going to the hospital. So I took off and I actually saw her uh, at the car and I just got in the car with my uniform on and drove her to the hospital. So, but anyway, that worked out fine. And, uh, and then the next, and then my start in, uh, in Oakland, uh, I think I gave up three runs in the first two innings and then that was it. And, and then, uh, we, Sabo hit two home runs. I mean, we just kind of displayed our offensive prowess that day. Uh, so they scored me a ton of runs. So, all right. So, but it was exciting, man. It's just uh, you, you, you almost have to pinch yourself, you know. No doubt. I mean, there's nothing. You're, there's, you know, you're at the no, big game. I mean, there's nothing you can you can really describe it. You know, just the feeling and what it's like. Yeah. I mean, now you've been there. I think you know you've been to a Super Bowl the last yeah. game of the year. I mean, that's yeah. that's what you want. You want to be able to play the last game of the year. Yep. Yeah. You're right. It's 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 indescribable. There's there's no doubt about it. All right, so I gotta I gotta check in with you on one of the most legendary pranks in, in Major League Baseball history, <laughs> July seventh, nineteen ninety three. You sneak out uh Wrigley Field during the game, spend a half an inning with the fans on the rooftop, you know, across the street on Sheffield Avenue, full uniform. It was a heck of a gag. Uh what was Davy yeah. Johnson's reaction? What was the reaction on that? Oh, he was like the principal, you know. I think he probably got marching <laughs> orders from Jim Bowden. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know, because I, I, I was there. I went over there in the top of the third inning. I, my, my intentions were to get in the scoreboard. Because a buddy of mine for the Pirates got this, the, the uh, ground crew guy to get him in the scoreboard at their center <laughs> field. He said it's awesome. So uh, when I got to, uh, we went out there for batting practice the first day back in Chicago. I went down to find the ground crew guy. Uh, he and I asked him. He said, "No." I said, "I already got in trouble for letting him in there." I said, "I can't do it." So, uh, so I'm out in the outfit with Kenny Belcher, and I said, "Man, man, what, what about one of them rooftops?" So we <laughs> ended up after batting practice going inside and talking to the clubhouse guy, and I said, "You know anybody that owns any of them buildings over there?" He goes, "Yeah, his name is George Lucas, not the George Lucas, but a George Lucas. Actually, he owns them all." 
Uh, I said, do you have him on, do you have a phone number? He goes, yeah. So I said, get him on the phone for me. So I got him on, I got on the phone with Mr. George. I'm with the Reds. You know, I'd like to maybe sneak over and sit on one of your rooftops, maybe happen in. And I think, uh, he said, that would be so cool. Why don't you meet me out in front of the Murphy's pub in the top of the third? Hour? <laughs> I said, okay. And Murphy's pub was on the corner right across the street from the uh, exit or the, where you get out of the, you leave Wrigley Field. Uh, so I met him at top third inning, went down three or four uh, buildings, got up, walked up three flights. And at that time, those, those were all apartments. Right. Those were apartments people were living in. So right. when I got in the, I uh, walked up three flights of stairs, uh, of that building. And, uh, and now when I revisited it, and I just got on the, the, the picture it shows me sitting on a white little fence thing there. And there was a landing right below me. So I wasn't really on the edge, you know, where I could fall off, fall, fall to my desk, three stories, or like <laughs> right, that. Right. Uh, I was semi, semi secure there. So, uh, so I got there and I started waving my boys and they saw me and they, you know, they were waving back. And <laughs> a, a lady says, are you really a ball player? And I said, yeah. She says, what are you doing over here? And I said, well, I just want to see what it's like to, to watch the ball game from over here. <laughs> and then Kevin Mister hit a three run homer. Uh, we took the lead. And then the girl says, hey, do you want a beer and a broth? And I said, no. I said, I'm already in enough trouble. I said, I better not do any, drink any alcohol. So, uh, But it worked out. By the top of the fourth inning, I was back in the dugout. Uh, we won the ball game 4-3. to three. But nobody said anything about Rio, you know, chasing them old ladies out of their seats with the super soaker that late in the game. You know, they wanted to <laughs> jump on me for, uh, for leaving the stadium. So. But, again, it was a nice gig. And, and to be honest, David, I think like 10 days later, we go play the Marlins for the first time uh, there in the league. That's, that's their first year in the league. And, and Wayne Huizenga actually sent his uh, secretary down to our clubhouse. He wanted me to sit in his restaurant sometime during the game. So Unreal. I had I had to bow out because Bowden hated me at that time. And we just, uh, with best, I just kind of stayed under the radar. So what did, uh, what, what did David, did David Johnson fine you? Or did you, did you get fined for that? Or what was the deal on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's it. Yeah, I mean, he came in, and, and like I said, it was like the principal's office. I went in there, and he kind of berated me and chastised me up one side, down the other, tried to tell me what a bad person I am and all that stuff. And right. I finally just had to stop him. I said, Davey, I said, yeah, what I did is wrong. It deserves a fine. You can tell me how much it is, and we'll leave it at that. Right. And I walked out, and so he said the next day, he said this $500, uh, to any, and it was to his girlfriend's charity. Uh-huh. Uh, so Marge Schott found out about that. And she was irate because, first of all, Davey was living with his girlfriend. They weren't married, so they were living in sin. Yes. Uh, you know, that was her, her, her deal on that. Right, so, But right. she was a little irritated that I ended up having, instead of writing it for a red charity, I ended up writing it to Davey's girlfriend's charity. So she, that didn't set too well with her. But uh, anyway, it was, a, you know, one of my career highlights. and. You know, a lot of people remember that more than my perfect game. I can tell you that. I, it's amazing. I'm telling you, 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 you've, you've gone, you've gone the gamut. What about the? I mean, I remember watching this. I remember watching on television the injury where you broke your arm, and it looked like your. It was gruesome looking. It looked like your arm separated from your shoulder when you were uh, during well, starting San Diego in May of '94. What was that like? That one hurt. <laughs> I guess. Uh, well, I mean. I had been in pain for the, you know, for like the last three weeks, whatever. And I thought I had was just developing some tendonitis, you know, and I was using that, uh, whatever that metal thing is, you know, to, to get the, to, to, you put, to you put heated, uh, atomic bomb on it and you yeah. rub it in, yeah. it, whatever. I don't know what that uh, ultrasound, maybe whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, but I was just putting on a spot exactly, you know, in the middle of my, uh, my, my humor. And I said, man, this is where it hurts right here. And, and, you know, like, again, I, after breaking the arm and after talking to doctors, I found out why I ended up breaking it. But, uh, yeah, I, when, when I threw the pitch, uh, the bottom half, you know, my shoulder and all that, the torque of that was too powerful for the arm to hold, to handle. So it ended up breaking in a, what they call a spiral oblique Man. of the humerus. Um, and, and when I went, when it happened, I went down. I mean, I wouldn't even, it felt like my arm fell off. Okay, so Barry Larkin comes to the mound. So I had a man on first and second, and uh, with two outs, and a guy named Archie Sanfranco, who's leading coach with my college teammate. So uh, anyway, he's up there to the plate, and I got two strikes on him, and I tried to reach back for a little bit extra, and that's what happened. It ended up breaking. So uh, Barry came to the mound, and, I, and he talked to me, and I'm kind of probably in a little bit of shock. 
and he says, uh, I said, Barry, is my arm still there? Unreal. And he said, yeah. Huh. You know, because I, I couldn't feel it. Once it broke, it just felt like it separated, like you said, from the, the middle of my humerus on down. I thought it just fell off. So. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I said, did that run score? He goes, yeah, almost two, because you weren't there to back up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, that one hurt. Uh, I, I was, you know, I was probably hard-headed because I was trying to pitch through it and instead of really getting pictures of it, because I, uh, uh, that was my last year with the Reds. The next year I went to Kansas City, and I told them that I had some, was having some problems, and they MRI'd it, and, you know, they did everything they could for like a whole week. Uh, of tests, you know, that's how further advanced we were. I mean, back then, of course, like I said, I was a rockhead. I was too stubborn. I wanted to pitch. I wanted, to, even though I, you know, in San Diego, I thought I wasn't throwing 70 miles an hour, but I took a no hitter in the fifth inning with doo doo. Uh, so when the sixth, anyone needed to get it out, I tried to reach back, and that's when it broke. So. Yeah, unreal. So in in uh, in 2000, uh, December of 2005, you uh, you led the fan balloting wire to wire to get in the Reds Hall of Fame in 2006. What, what did it mean to you to become a member of the Reds Hall of Fame? The Probably the, the, the greatest honor I could have been bestowed. Mm. Uh, I went in there with Tom Seaver and Lee May. Wow. You know, Tom Seaver, obviously, you know, an icon. Lee May, an icon, maybe one of the funniest guys. I enjoyed being around him. Um, but it was truly an honor. You know, I just – and I was nervous. Uh, my mom was there. She had just uh, she was a year removed from uh, uh, small cell lung cancer that she had beaten. Uh, so it was it was kind of a cool day for me. Um, I did drink a lot before I had to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so I started rambling, and Tony Perez finally said, "Hey, hey, hey, hey!" I said, "Okay." Doggy says, "I'm done. I guess I'm done." So thank you very much. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was just such such an honor because I grew up a Reds fan. Uh, I met Johnny Bench when I was like 11 out there in Castle, Wyoming. Pete came out when I was 13 um, for our banquet. Uh, so I, it was, a, you know, Reggie Jackson came out in between, and I didn't really care about that. But, you know, I, I still have the black and white Johnny Bench card that he signed. And, uh, you know, Pete, that, it, was, it was cool. Uh you know, because of being a Reds fan. I, and my first game I ever saw, my first professional big league game I ever saw was in Montreal, Canada. And I saw the Reds play against the Expos. Uh, and it went 14 innings. And, and Pete Rose was in the middle of his hitting streak. And he actually got, uh, I think, Joe Morgan. He or Somebody hit a sack fly to score, uh, score Joe Morgan in the, in, the, uh, in the 14th inning to win the ball game. And after the game, Pete was in the dugout, and we, we had worked our way down towards the dugout by the end of the game, and he was in there drinking an orange crush. And I remember saying, hey, nice game, Mr. Rose. He looked back and said, hey, thanks, fella. Huh. You know? And then uh, I think what, uh, let me see, what was that, 80? That was 78. So eight, seven years later, I got to sit in the dugout and look at the, in the stands where I stood as a kid. So it was, and, and I had Pete, I was telling Pete the story. You know, because I was, you know, being a big Red fan and stuff. And, I, you know, the bad thing is I told him I loved number five. <laughs> I wore Johnny Bench's number, you know, because I was a really Johnny Bench fan. He goes, yeah, well, one and four, 14, that one and four makes five, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'll tell you what, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it really is. You, you've had a heck of a career, I mean, as a, as a big league pitcher. And then uh, you've done some broadcast work. You've been a special instructor. You've been a pitching coach. I mean, Baseball, I mean, it's your life. There's no question about it. What, what's given you the most joy after your playing career? Uh, well, because I coached for 10 years, you know, and uh, seeing those guys, you know, like I, like I had Tyler Molly and TJ Antone. I had Amir Garrett, um, yep. Robert Stevenson. I mean, seeing all these guys get there, yep. you know. You know, cause I used to glorify it. You know, cause I remember when, when, when Tucker – Barnhart ended up by somebody got hurt. I think it was when he got to the big leagues the first year, uh, his first time going to big leagues. He got somebody, one of the catchers got hurt, so he had he got to make the team. And I remember seeing him, and he said, "Hey, man, I heard it's awesome." I said, "No, not really." I said, "It, it starts at awesome, hmm. and it gets better from there." Hmm. So just be prepared. I said, uh, "You know, but but seeing those guys, 
go through the grind and, and uh, to get to the big leagues and then get up there and have some success. You know, I, I think it's, 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 that's probably more as gratifying uh, because, you know, if that's the ultimate goal for when them kids, you know, sign those contracts and they go through the minor league uh, system and to, to work their way up to the big leagues. You know, you, 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 my first year of coaching, uh, I'll say this, David, I was out in Billings, Montana, and I was going to get every one of those pitches to the big leagues. I think only two of them made it. So. Right. You know, you just realize that you just give them the opportunity to, to hone their skills, to become better pitchers, but you really try to get them to be independent on, on their own stuff, be your own best pitching coach. Cause you, you know, we, you're going to have somebody different everywhere you go. Uh, so be able to, you know, maintain whatever you need to maintain to be the pitcher you need to be, uh, you know, and then and watch them, you know, sometimes they struggle and sometimes they don't, you know. And, and I, I said, you know what, I enjoyed getting beat up. I had one kid, his name was Clayton Tunick. Uh, I was in, in, in uh, Billings, Montana. He was from North Carolina State. He was uh, like a fifth-round pick, pretty high pick, pretty good pitcher. Uh, we were in Orem, Utah, which is the only – uh, stadium in the whole league where the clubhouse is connected to the, the dugout. Well, Clayton decides to give up nine runs in the first inning and he can't get out of the first inning. Uh, so he ends up getting taken out of the game. And I, you know, I waited a couple, three innings. Uh, and then I went in there and he was in his locker, had his head in his hands and stuff, you know, and I said, Clayton, I'll, I'll be honest. I said, I've never given up nine runs in an inning like that before. I said, but I did give up 10. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, yeah, it happens, man, it happens. It just, you know, sometimes you just can't, you know, everything you do, like every, everything, every ball they hit today, they found a hole. Yeah. Said they jumped, you know, jam shots, made it over the infielder's head, stuff like that. I said, so just, you know, I'll let you talk about this one, whatever I said, but tomorrow we'll go to the ballpark, we'll get ready for our next start. So, uh, but that, I enjoyed, really, I enjoyed that coaching. I enjoyed watching those guys, uh, again, compete, learn. You know, I knew when I had I had Tyler Molly and, and T.J. Anton at the same time in Dayton, Ohio. And I knew when I got them there, I said, these guys are going to pitch in the big leagues. Right. There's a couple more that I thought stood up, too, but they got hurt and, uh, and ended up getting regular jobs. So. You have three sons. Uh, Logan, your son Logan, I know he's in the Red Sox farm system. Is he still with the Red Sox? Yeah, yeah. Was, he had to take the year off last year. It was just kind of weird. In fact, I just texted him a little bit ago uh, about – um, how to approach because you know, he had a, 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 some time off. Uh, they had the whole year off, and I, and I know when I broke my arm it was because I had a couple of years uh, where I only was only half uh, there half a year. So, right. Uh, I'm just trying to get him to you know build up to to game speed, and it shouldn't be there the first day of spring training or your first day. You know, uh, just try to get him to take care of that arm and, and rest it because it, it, you're not going to be able to. You know, I, I think that's going to be probably one of the things you're going to see this year is a lot more arm injuries because of the time off. Yeah. You know, I was I was throwing 220, 30 innings every year, and then the two years I did, I threw under 200 innings. Uh, my arm actually got weaker. Actually, the bone got less dense than it was, and that's why I ended up breaking it. But, yeah. you know, I think when you don't stretch your arm like it's just being stressed, and all of a sudden you want to try and overpower it, I think that's where the arm injury is going to show up, so. Uh, but yeah, he's he's uh, finished up in high eight a couple of years ago. I saw him pitch in uh, Lexington. Uh, you know, he's, he's about five eight, five nine, but uh, throws about ninety four. Wow. Uh, he's a lefty. He was actually David. He was actually the uh, Division two Player of the Year his senior year because he was uh, eleven and two on the hill, and he would hit like four forty during the season because he was a two way player then. So. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but they, when they got to Boston, they made him strictly a pitcher. So, uh, but he had a decent year. Uh, unfortunately, last year they, they they canceled the year. So, uh, I'm just hoping that he goes in there healthy and then has a full year. But I, I'm 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 expecting him probably get a chance to pitch for the Double A team this year. So that's awesome. Can't let you go without uh, getting your prediction forecast. Uh, your thoughts on the 2021 20, Reds? What do you think? Well, I, I think uh, we, we have some pitching. I think they went out and got some more bullpen, uh, you know, and do little. And, you know, I know Amir Garrett chomped at the bit to be the closer. And, you know, it's his job to lose kind of thing. I'm not a big fan of, you know, that kind of thing. But I do – I like Amir Garrett. I love everything about him. So, I'm going to give him some leeway there. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I think, you know, I, I, I think what happened last year, uh, even though it was only a, what, a 60-game schedule, 
they still got a taste of the playoffs. they still got a taste of a pennant race. Uh, I think they're a year older. The young kids are a year older. Uh, so I, 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 I think, you know, you know, the Cardinals went out and got the Aaron the Aerodondo, whatever his name is. So they're always up in their thing. And, uh, but I, I think we probably have this, uh, the team, uh, that, that's going to qualify for this. Gonna, uh, hopefully I want to win the pennant, you know, yeah. that's going to be a tough division, but I, you know, I, I think Milwaukee and St. Louis are going to be, uh, and Chicago will always be there as well. But I, I like our chances. You know, I think if our if our starters stay healthy, you know, I wish I'd love to have Trevor Bauer back. He was awesome. He was Something. absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I've never seen, but you know, I saw Rio and I saw Danny Jackson win twenty three games uh, one year. So yeah. I mean, Danny had the greatest year I ever saw. But I'll tell you what, that Trevor Bauer, uh, Dodgers got themselves a good one there. Yeah. Of course, the Dodgers now have five aces. <laughs> That's crazy. Money, money talks, man, huh? I expect to win. I expect to win. Tom can't tell you how much fun this has been. You've uh, you've had a hell of a career and, and and you've had fun the whole time. That's that's the great thing. Yeah. People when people get to know Tom Browning, <laughs> they realize what a treat it is, man. You're something special. Oh well, I like George Brett said. He said you just look like fun was always fine to me. <laughs> I said yeah, it, it, it did. I did. I had fun. I enjoyed it. You know, again, when you're a starting pitcher and you got four days off, you know, you find silly things to do. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. You know, I but I can t- promise you. There was no day that was more important to me than my game day. You yep. know, I really that because that was my one day to be a, a player. I got to participate in the game, you know, and I wanted to, even though I batted ninth and, uh, you know, if I had a man on base, I was going to bunt him over. Uh, I still enjoyed that day, and that, that, that day was always, you know, held special to me because I, I took pride in that day. Well, you're a hell of a player, no question about it. And uh, it was a, it was great, great to catch up with you, Tom. Glad things are going so well for you. Yeah, thank you, David.